and hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to unit 2 or chapter 2.1 for today's reading of AP World History Modern AMSCO readings. And today we're going to dive right on into unit 2, Networks of Exchange from 1200 to 1450. But first, yes, as you can tell, there is different background music. You are not going crazy. I'm going to be doing that for every chapter. Each piece is going to have a new a uh, background music or BGM to reflect somewhat on the kind of mood of the chapter. Granted, this isn't kind of lighthearted, but that's kind of a little bit of bits and pieces of the chapter. However, because after all, this is describing the entirety of trade. Now, understand the context between 1200 and 1450. Economic activity along existing trade routes increased in volume and scope. Technological and commercial innovations, imperial expansion, and demand for luxury goods were key factors in the ongoing expansion of trade. Growing trade networks accelerated cultural, biological, and technological diffusion across Afro-Eurasia. Factors that expanded trade between 1200 and 1450, the rise of powerful states and empires played a critical role in increasing the volume and geographical reach of existing trade networks. The Mongol Empire promoted trade along the Silk Roads, creating a vast commercial network across Eurasia. Trade routes across the Sahara and in the Indian Ocean added both West Africa and East Africa to this network. Improvements on previously existing commercial practices, including forms of credit, facilitated larger networks of exchange. Driving this growth in trade was a growing demand for luxury goods, such as silk and porcelain from China and gold from Africa. Consequences of Trade In the context of this growing trade, powerful new trading cities emerged scattered across Africa and Eurasia. Trade provided the, settling, the setting for significant cross-cultural exchanges. As merchants and other travelers moved from place to place, they introduced new religious beliefs such as Islam and developments in technology such as paper making and gunpowder to new communities. Against the backdrop of this transfer of ideas and things came across also the rapid spread of deadly diseases and most notably the bubonic plague. And as you can see here, before we dive into 2.1, we actually had a small timeline of some events that had occurred. Now, whether or not this was the same one as the last timeline that was previously shown is unknown to me at the moment. But something that can be considered is that this may be significant. Or at least something to keep in mind for you AP students taking your AP World Test. Chapter 2.1, The Silk Roads. Quote, and don't forget that if you treat the custom house officers with respect and make them something of a great present in goods or money, as well as their clerks and dragomen, they will behave with great civility and always be ready to appraise your wares below their real value. End quote. Italian merchant Francesco Balducci Pelagalotti, 1471. Essential question. What were the causes and effects of the growth of networks of exchange after 1200? More than 1300 years later, after the first accounts of travel on the Silk Roads, these fabled routes that had fallen into disuse had revived by the 8th and 9th centuries. As described by merchant Pegalotti, the land route of the Silk Roads was vibrant and essential to inter-regional trade in the 14th and 15th centuries. Demand for luxury goods increased in Europe and Africa. Chinese, Persian, and Indian artisans and merchants expanded their production of textiles and porcelains for export. Caravans made travel safer and more practicable, and the Chinese developed a system using paper money to manage increasing trade. Interregional trade on the Silk Road flourished. Causes of the Growth of Exchange Networks the Crusades helped pave the way to expanding networks of exchange as lords and their armies of knights brought back fabrics and spices from the east. Despite the inroads on the Byzantine Empire by the Ottoman Turks, the Silk Road's trade routes remained in operation, as did sea routes across the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean. 
China was still eager for Europe's gold and silver, and Europe was growing more eager than ever for silk, tea, and rhubarb. Global trade increased, although Europeans had not yet found a route across the Cape of Good Hope. At the southern tip of Africa, they had been making a overland trips across Europe for many centuries. Rise of New Empires After the collapse of classical civilizations, such as the Roman and Han empires, the first golden age of the Silk Road came to an end, and activity declined dramatically. However, by the 8th and 9th centuries, Arab merchants from the Abbasid Empire revived the land route of the Silk Roads as well as sea routes in the Indian Ocean. Tang China had much to offer the newly revived global trade network, including the compass, paper, and gunpowder. China exported porcelain, tea, and silk. From other parts of Asia, China imported cotton, precious stones, pomegranates, dates, horses, and grapes. These luxury goods appealed to the upper class of Chinese society, whose members re reveled in their country's newfound affluence. <coughs> this period marked the second golden age of the Silk Roads. No other cause, however, had as significant an impact on the expansion of trade as did the rise of the Mongol Empire. Mongols conquered the Abbasid Caliphate in 1258, and in the 14th century, China came under their control as well. Parts of the Silk Roads that were under the authority of different rulers were for the time unified in a system under the control of an authority that respected merchants and enforced the laws. The Mongols improved roads and punished bandits, both of which increased the safety of travel on the Silk Roads. New trade channels were also established between Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. Those who survived the conquest by the Mongols and their descendants benefited from the reinvigoration of trade routes that had not been heavily used since the days of the Roman and Han empires. You'll read more about the Mongols in Topic 2.2 or the next video in this playlist and on my channel. Improvements in Transportation Technologies Another cause for the expansion of exchange networks was the improvement of transportation. Travelers on the overland Silk Roads learned that traveling with others in caravans was safer than traveling alone. They also learned how to design saddles for camels that greatly increased the weight of the load the animals could carry. Centuries earlier, China had made advances in naval technology that allowed it to control sea-based trade routes in the South China Sea. During the Han Dynasty, Chinese scientists developed the magnetic compass and improved the rudder, both of which helped aid navigation and ship control along the seas. The Chinese junk, also developed in the Han Dynasty, was a boat similar to the Southwest Asian Dehou. It had multiple sails and was as long as 400 feet, at least triple the size of the typical Western European ship of its time. The hull of a junk was divided into compartments. The wall is making these divisions strengthened the ship for rough voyages at sea and made sinking less likely. Effects of the Global Exchange Networks Two significant effects of the expansion and stability of the Silk Roads were the series of oasis oasises that developed along the routes, including thriving cities and commercial innovations that greatly helped to manage the increasing trade. Cities and oasises Long stretches of the overland Silk Roads passed through inhospitable terrain, hot arid lands where water was scarce. Cities along the routes that were watered by rivers became thriving centers of trade. For example, the city of Kashgar is located at the western edge of China where northern and southern routes of the Silk Roads crossed, leading to destinations in Central Asia, India, Pakistan, and Persia. It sits where the Taklamakan Desert meets the Tian Sha Mountains, and is watered by the Kashgar River, which has made the lands along it fertile for crops such as wheat, rice, fruits, and cotton. Travelers on the Silk Roads depended on Kashgar for its abundance of water and food. Artisans in Kashgar produced textiles, rugs, leather goods, and pottery. Its food and handicrafts were sold in a bustling market. At the crossroads of both ideas and goods, 
the once primarily Buddhist city also became a center of Islamic scholarship. Similarly, Samarkand in present-day Uzbekistan in the Sirajanshan River Valley was a stopping point on the Silk Road between China and the Mediterranean. Samarkand was a center of cultural exchange as much as it was a center of trading goods. Archaeological remains show the presence of diverse religions, including Christianity, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Islam. Like Kashgar, Samarkand was known for its artisans as well as its centers of Islamic learning and magnificently decorated mosques. And as you can see here, there's a map actually of the Silk Roads during the year 1200, which can be very handy, showing as it goes through Asia all the way to the Middle East over here, which is the sort of middleman connecting Europe and the rest of over and the, the connecting the rest of Eurasia to Africa, as demonstrated through this little point right around here. However, there's also Africa right over here and then Europe at the top, and then what would be Russia at the top. Anyways, back to the reading. Caravan Sarai. Large flourishing trading cities such as Kashgar and Samarkand, however, were not the only oasises along the arid Silk Roads. Once the routes of the Silk Roads became stabilized, inns became as Karen Sarai sprang up, often about 100 miles apart. That distance is how far camels could travel for before they needed water. At the Caravanserai, travelers could rest both themselves and their animals and sometimes trade their animals for fresh ones. The word Caravanserai derives from the Persian words for caravan and palace. Commercial Innovations To manage the increasing trade, China developed new financial systems. China had long been a money economy, using money rather than bartering with such commodities as cowrie shells or salt. However, the copper coins they used became too unwidely to transport for everyday transactions, so the government developed a system of credit known as flying cash. This allowed a merchant to deposit paper money under his name in one location and withdraw the same amount at another location. Locations for exchanging flying cash became the model for the banks of the modern era, including the banking houses established in the European cities in the 1300s. At a banking house, a person could present a bill of exchange, a document stating the holder was legally promised payment of a set amount on a set date, and receive that amount of money in exchange. Each of these innovations encouraged and supported trade by providing convenience and the stability of institutions. However, looking at this image though, that we may have skipped over, its source is Wikimedia Commons, credit with the photo by Babic Glossadi, sorry for butchering the name, with the caption, the entrances to Canberra Sarai's were large enough to allow animals as well as people to enter. Inside the enclosure, there were stalls for animals as well as chambers for people. This is Karan Versailles in, in is in Iran. So as you can see here, here's an image of what it may look like. And now, back to the reading. The Crusades reawakened Europeans' interest in luxury goods from Asia. To acquire them, they organized the trade of European resources. In the 13th century, cities in northern Germany and Scandinavia formed a commercial alliance called the Hanasidic League. Controlling trade in the North Sea and the Baltic Sea, member cities of the League, such as Lübeck, Hamburg, and Riga, were able to drive out pirates and monopolize trade in goods such as timber, grain, leather, and salted fish. League ships would leave the Baltic and Northern Seas. They would round the Atlantic coast of Western Europe, proceeding to the ports of the Mediterranean. There, they might pick up some valuable goods from Arab caravans. The League lasted until the mid-17th century, when national governments became strong enough to protect their merchants. And as we can see here, there is also a chart with innovations in commerce 500 to 1603. Let's begin. Financial instrument, coin. Description, minted precious metals, silver, bronze, gold, with own inherent value. Origin date, 500 BCE. Early location, 
Lydia, Turkey. Financial instruments, Koran, Versailles. Description, inns along trade routes where travelers could trade and rest and replenish. Origin date, 500 BCE. Early location, Persian Empire. Paper money is the financial instrument for this next one, with the description of currency in paper form, with an origin date of 800 CE. Early location, China. Financial instrument, Hanseatic League. Description, first common market and confederation of merchant golds. Origin date, 1296 CE. Early location, Germany. Financial instrument, banking house. Description, precursor to modern banking. Origin date, 200 BCE. Early location, China. Financial instrument, bill of exchange. Description, a written order without interest that binds one party to pay a fixed sum to another party at a predetermined date in the future. Origin date, 700 CE. Early location, also China. Increase in demand. The growing demand for luxury goods from Afro-Eurasia, China, Persia, and India led to a corresponding increase in the supply of those goods through expanded production. Craft workers expanded their production of such goods as silk and other textiles and porcelains for export. Increased demand also led to the expansion of iron and steel manufactured in China, motivating its proto-industrialization. See Topic 1.1 or another video in the previous unit on my channel and also all fully covered. Key Terms by Theme Technology, Sea Trade Magnetic Compass, Rudder, Junk Government, New Empires Mongol Empire Culture, Trade Cities, Kashgar, Samarkand. Economics, Innovations. Koran von Versailles. Money, Economy. Flying Cash. Paper Money. Banking Houses. Bill of Exchange. And Hanseatic League. And ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for today's reading. I really hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, please hit the like button. And remember also to subscribe as well. You can unsubscribe anytime it becomes an inconvenience. And also hit the notification bell to stay up to date and when I post more content. Anyways, I hope you all have an amazing day or night. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, to stay happy, stay safe, and remember to stay entertained. Along with chapter 2.2 coming right up on the next video or in 5 seconds. 3, 2, 1, advertisement.